Thanks, Deanne. That's good music to listen to to calm the soul. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome. <laughs> Sorry, I'll give you a chance. I want to welcome all who are worshiping here with us today, um, both here and on Zoom. It's a beautiful, cool, rain-drenched morning with trees falling down. <laughs> Please stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship. It's printed in your bulletin. We believe in a God of justice. We say, Surely there is a God who judges on earth. But there is so much wrong in the world. We say, Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods, you powers? Do you judge people fairly? No. In your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. And so we cry. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. The wicked go astray from the womb. They err from their birth, speaking lies. They are venomous like the serpent. And in fear we cry. Surely. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. Like grass, let them be trodden down and wither. We will rejoice and say, Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Our opening hymn is number 287 in Voices Together. Jesus Christ is waiting.
You may be seated. We are all blessed with many things. We are asked by the scripture to share our first fruits with others. You can and do share monetary gifts through PayPal or by placing something in the offering plates in the back. I invite you to listen to Deanne play our musical offering and reflect on this call. Let us pray. Jesus of love and leftovers, we struggle with what to share and how much is enough. Sometimes we are like the disciples, quietly suggesting you send the needy crowds away. And sometimes we are like the crowds, bringing only our desire to be close to you. When we have little, embolden us to share it. And when we have nothing, welcome us to stay and eat. In giving and receiving, we participate in the miracle of enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Time now for the children to come forward and let's sing number 511, Come on Children to the Gospel Feast. Mimi, you want to get us started? Our scripture reading this morning comes from a psalm that doesn't get much airtime. Um, we have been traveling through the psalms and I have promised you angry psalms and that is where we are this morning. Um, so just be prepared for some of the language in this psalm. We're going to sing it or we're going to, Myra will read the passage and we will sing Voices Together 792, How Can Our Anger Give Life? And we'll sing that twice through, Myra will read. After a little bit, we'll sing it twice through, or we'll sing it again, um, back and forth. You'll know, it'll be obvious. When Deanne starts playing, then that's when you sing. <laughs> By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung our harps, for there our captors ask us for songs and our tormentors ask for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If 
if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, and let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall be they who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall, be, happy shall they be who took their little ones and dashed them against the rocks. Will you pray with me? God, we believe that you are a God of love. We also believe that you are a God of justice and that you seek the good of the world. Help us as we see this world that is not as it should be to be angry about what you are angry about, to work for what you desire. Amen. I want you to think about the last time you were angry. Not simply peeved, not simply annoyed, but angry. Maybe enraged is a good word. Um, because, you know, I get peeved in my day-to-day -day life. If I go too long without eating, I get hangry. I get bothered by inconveniences. But I personally don't get angry very often. So it's easy enough for me to think about the last time I was angry. Maybe you get angry more often, and that's okay too. Just think about it. As you think about that, I want you just for a moment to reach out and sort of touch that anger and remember what it was like. You don't have to let it all come crashing in, but just think about it for a moment. Why were you angry? How long did your anger last? And most importantly for this morning, what did you do with that anger? I want to tell you that this sermon was very difficult to extract from my brain. When I read the imprecatory psalms, that's what these are called, psalms of cursing, I get this weird feeling in the pit of my stomach. I don't like it very much. And I think this is because, like a lot of people, I'm pretty scared of anger and what it can do. The psalms that we are talking about this morning are psalms that express this scalding, brutal anger, very honest feeling. The psalms we are talking about this morning are filled with calls for vengeance and so much anger, and so many of us are scared of anger. But as Audre Lorde says in her essay, Uses of Anger, which I'll be drawing from heavily this morning, really, you guys could just all go home and read Audre Lorde's essay, and probably she has better things to say than me. But she says, my fear of anger taught me nothing. Your fear of anger will teach you nothing also. We fear anger, our own, and we fear the anger of others, but our fear of anger 
will not serve us well. So, what did you do the last time you were angry? Sort of funny example from when I was just peeved a few weeks ago. I talked with my husband, Albert, about my frustrations on a topic. And then later I had to take it to my best friend because I said Albert was being far too reasonable <laughs> and giving me nice suggestions and I just really need someone to hear how frustrated I am. Indeed, we often take our anger to others, whether it is just simply being peeved or being really quite upset, right? We want to be heard because our family and friends usually can't change the thing we're angry about, but we want someone to have heard and seen us. Sometimes we do get angry enough that we file a complaint or send a strongly worded email. Sometimes we're less official than that and we end up bursting into someone's office, red-faced and ready to chew them out. And still sometimes we feel unable to express our anger, so we hold it inside until it bursts out at the least opportune moment. We've been drawing from Walter Brueggemann throughout our psalm series, and he, in talking about his psalms of vengeance, or in, in the psalms of vengeance when he talks about them, he says, there are three things we can do when we're really angry, when we're enraged. We can seek vengeance, we can deny our anger, or we can give it over to God. Brueggemann compares it to a wise parent responding to a sibling dispute. If two siblings are out in the yard and one hurts the other and the one who was hurt comes in and cries and cries and cries and says, what are you going to do to my sibling who hurt me? Brueggemann compares it to, compares God to say, basically the parent that says, why don't you leave that to me? I will take it. I will figure it out. In this way, anger does not fester within our hearts, rotting away until it bursts forth, nor does it get acted out in vengeance. Instead, judgment is left in God's capable hands. And in their best version, that's kind of what these psalms are doing. They're laying their anger at God's feet so that it doesn't fester. Did you take your anger to God last time you were angry? Did that even occur to you? If not, don't feel bad. But maybe try it next time. <laughs> I don't tend to take my anger to God either. I think it's because I am afraid of my own anger. I'm afraid of the anger of others, and I don't, even though I know that God knows everything about me, I don't want to look so bad in front of God. My anger is dangerous, and I try to stay far away from it. But the psalmists, or at least the psalmists in 137, don't seem to have been so scared of anger. If you've been reading through the psalms with us, you've read some of those colorful curses or imprecations. <laughs> that are found in the Psalms. Melissa Flora Bixler has a nice list of them in her book, How to Have an Enemy, about infliction of genital pain, blindness, a rain of sulfur, the amputation of tongues and lips at their enemies, regular clothes be swapped out for shame and dishonor. The list goes on and on, there's this very the psalmists are not scared to be angry at their enemies. At the end of Psalm 58, which is where our call to worship came from this morning, we get in verse 10, the righteous will be glad when they are avenged, when they dip their feet in the blood of the wicked. It's very intense. I read that and I was like, whoa, that's no joke. It stops me in my tracks. This is the Bible, not a slasher film. It's the Psalms. It's supposed to be nice and sheep and calm waters. And then, of course, we have the big bad, which is Psalm 137. It's an infamous psalm, probably only to those of us who love things like reading all the obscure passages, but it's infamous to me. It's opening by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down and there we wept and we remembered Zion. Is this poignant and moving verse. It's uh, immortalized in God's spell. There's a beautiful version of this. If you've heard anything from this psalm, it's from those first six verses. 
because that opening lament, we cannot sing God's songs in a foreign land, that just, you can feel the pathos. The moving reverence for Jerusalem, the city that has fallen, this is a psalm written from exile. In 2 Kings 25, we hear the, call, the story of the day of Jerusalem's fall. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon kills King Zedekiah of Judah, kills his whole family, burns every important building in Jerusalem to the ground, including the temple. And the chapter starkly states in verse 21, so Judah went into captivity away from her land. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. I think today of how many people weep for their home. Of Palestinians living in tents in Rafa. Of asylum seekers at the US-Mexico border. Of the indigenous people who were here on this land, this turtle island long before the Europeans. Of the Africans who were torn from their land and made slaves in this one. And even on the micro level of those who are evicted from their homes, their belongings piled out on the curb by police, their lives were ever disrupted because of property. Those who sit not by the river, but by the highway, weeping for the place that they've lost. And when I think of these things, historic and current, I do get angry. I told you two weeks ago that the Psalms of disorientation exist because the world is not as it should be and we're fed up with it. The Psalms of disorientation are the cry of those who've been promised something better than what we have. And this version, this angry version of disorientation calls not only for things to be made right, but for punishment to settle the score for what has been done. The Psalm says, Babylon, you devastator. Babylon, what have you done? We fear anger, but in the face of all that is wrong in the world, how can we avoid being angry? Speaking after the murder of George Floyd by police in 2020, Willie Jennings said, as I watched the life drain out of George Floyd, I sensed even more deeply, once again, the struggle against that hopelessness which today, I have to say, feels like it's winning. I repeated many times the lesson that my parents and my people taught me about hope. Hope is a discipline. It is not a sentiment. Jennings continues, what I have also learned is living the discipline of hope in this racial world, in this white supremacist infected, infested country called the United States of America, to live that discipline of hope requires anger. I am angry. As long as I can remember, I have sent this anger in me like the constant low humming sound, sounding from my very being. Racism, you devastator. Audre Lorde, in writing about her experience as a black lesbian woman, writes, every woman has a well-stocked arsenal of anger potentially useful against those oppressions, personal and institutional, which brought the anger into being. Sexism, you devastator. Homophobia, you devastator. Misogynoir, you devastator. Lord and Jennings helped me to grasp my own rage, my own anger at the state of the world. Their writing helps me to catch a glimpse, an unpleasant glimpse, but still, <laughs> of why Psalm 137 ends the way that it does. Because I have been mad at the ba Babylons of our day. There are plenty of devastators out there. I scroll on social media and I see posts about transphobic bills being presented across our country. I see my right to birth control being debated in Congress. I see stories about people, especially women, denied life-saving health care. I share and save videos of families desperately trying to get out of Gaza. America, you devastator. And not only do Jennings and Lord help me to take a hold of my anger, they also help me figure out what to do with it. For Audre Lorde, anger is a clarifying force, 
As a black woman, she calls white women to truly listen to the cries of women of color, to sit with our anger and translate it into action. This for Lord is how we, quote, identify who are allies and with whom we have, allies with whom we have grave differences and who are our genuine enemies. It is not that we will all one day be the same and understand everything together, but that we can, even as we don't understand everything, even as we are very different, we can fight for each other's humanity. Jennings puts it this way, again, speaking after the murder of George Floyd. My anger is shareable. Indeed, one of the most stubborn barriers to overcoming this racial world is the refusal of so many people to take hold of black anger. It is a particular sickness of whiteness that invites people to imagine themselves as spectators of racial suffering and observers of black pain who are not allowed to feel or who are allowed to feel only assorted forms of white guilt. And Lord goes on to talk about guilt as well saying that it is a level of impotence, of inaction. We can feel bad, but she wants us to feel angry, to do something. Jennings continues in a more theological vein, one that I think might make you feel a little better. <laughs> Those of us who are Christian, we should know better. God wants us to hate what God hates. God invites us to a shared fury, but only the kind that we creatures can handle. You all know that anger is frightening because it is not easily controllable. Anger can easily touch hatred, and if anger enters into hatred, then we will be drawn into violence, and way too many people in this world have been drawn deeply into violence. He continues, what Christian faith knows is that the way to keep Anger from hatred is not to deny anger, not to pretend it isn't real. No, that we can't do. What keeps anger from touching hatred is not the cunning of reason or the power of will. It is simply Jesus. Can we share our anger? Can we let it be a clarifying force? Can we understand the violence of Psalm 137 without falling into that violence ourselves? Can we catch a glimpse, but not seek to find vengeance ourselves? Can we leave this at God's feet, but maintain the power of anger? Can we hand our desire for vengeance over to Jesus and hold fast instead to our desire to dismantle the cause of our fury? Can we take hold of our anger, the anger of others, of our screams, of our dissatisfaction with the world? Can we take hold of that and find ways to build one another up, affirm the dignity of one another, stand against the anger that is turned to hatred and seeks to destroy us? Can we do it? Will we do it? Do not be afraid of your anger. Share it, take hold of it, and never forget to seek Jesus all the while. Do not be afraid. Amen. We will sing number 794, If the War Goes On. And I invite you to stand as you are able.
in your sickness. So my friends, as you go, go with God, for as the hymn says, and as I always say, <laughs> you cannot go where God is not. In your rage, in your anger, go in love as well, so that your anger might be touched by Jesus and not fall into hatred, but that it might be grasped hold of so that we can transform the world. Go with that purpose, to transform, to change, to make this world as it should be. And God will honor your dedication. And go in peace, for it is the gift of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.